So this is where we're at now. Are we ready to bring in uh, Ray McGovern to continue our, we've just laid out some of the things going on here. Uh, if Ray's listening and he wants to join. Sure. Please hop in, Ray. Good to see Can you again you after me? a long absence from our vigil. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. There was an excused absence. Uh, we were moving our house or household uh, to uh, to safer territory from the swamp, uh, the swamp in Washington. Uh, well, let me just uh, start with uh, why Julian Assange is hated so much. I mean, hello. He has this unique ability to receive leaks. Now, that's L E A. K S, and I think that's why they call it WikiLeaks. Okay, now why do I, why do I stress leaks? Well, it's because when Julian Assange published uh, the great offense here, the, the the Democratic National Committee emails, those were from leaks. Okay, now how do I know that? Well, we can look at that later, but we can prove that forensically. Uh, our technicians, technicians actually, the technical directors of the National Security Agency, have gone through the forensics, something that James Comey forgot to do, or said he didn't do, or said he relied on a firm hired and paid by the Democratic National Committee. In any case, um, those emails were leaked to WikiLeaks, and as Julian Assange or any other reputable, and I, I would have to word, use the word courageous as well, publisher would do, he published them. Now, did the publication of those emails affect the election? Um, it's hard to tell really, it, to be really honest, but the more, more appropriate question is, were they authentic? I mean, did Julian, for the first time in his publishing life, fool around with them and sort of massage them? <laughs> no, everyone recognizes that they were authentic. What did they show? Well, they showed that Hillary Clinton stole the Democratic nomination from Bernie Sanders, okay? Well, that's pretty damaging. And I'm willing to, to say that that didn't help Hillary Clinton one wish, and it may have uh, influenced some people, uh, to vote against her. I certainly wasn't going to vote, vote for her in the beginning, but uh, that doesn't really matter in, in my case. So what do we say here? Well, we say that uh, not only was Julian Assange guilty as charged of publishing true authentic documentation that may have afflict, affected an election, but he showed no remorse he thought he was doing his job, and of course he was. Uh, and all of a sudden, Julian publishes more material from leaks. Now, what am I referring to? Are you referring to the so-called Vault 7 documents? Now, they were published by WikiLeaks in March, some of them, uh, as a result of a leak from a CIA staffer, we, we think now, because one has been charged, who thought that, you know, um, deceiving the world populace by these very fancy cyber tools is really not what the United States should be doing. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this array of cyber tools that CIA and the experts, the real experts at NSA, work together with, and we know when they started, because Bill Binney was still around then, about 15 years ago, and what they created was a, a Vault 7 array involving, catch this now, 700 million lines of code. Now, when Bill Binney first told me that, I, <laughs> I'm a history major, right? I said, Bill, it sounds like a lot, <laughs> he's this array. That's a lot, all right? Uh, look at it this way, Ray. Can, can you do multiplication still? I said, yeah, I can do that. He said, multiply that by $25 a line. 
Now, who's capable of creating such a, a capability? Only NSA and CIA. So what's the, the result of that? Well, in middle March, middle March, in the middle of March, 2017, uh, Julian Assange announced that he had this array of cyber tools that in volume, they rivaled, if not exceeded, all the information that Ed Snowden took out into Hong Kong, and that he was gonna publish them bit by bit. Wow. <laughs> now the first two were really interesting. A cyber tool that allowed you to take control of a car and make it go 120 miles an hour. You, know, kill, you could kill somebody that way. And we think that's happened. Uh, so that, that made the New York Times on the 7th of March, 2017. And another tool. Uh, this one allows you to listen to conversations anywhere near a, uh, a television that appears to be off, but is really recording and sending everything you say. That was sexy enough. But on the 31st of March, and this is really interesting, so tune in now. On the 31st of March, there was a tool called Marble Framework, okay? Now, what did that tool allow people to do? Well, it allowed them to hack into other servers or computers, disguise who it was that was hacking in, and leave little breadcrumbs, the little telltale signs about who may have hacked in. Now, the CIA worked in five languages, Korean, Persian, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. Hmm. We also knew from these authentic WikiLeaks documents or Vault 7 documents published by WikiLeaks that this tool was used in 2016. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, that information became available at the very end of the 30th of March, 2017. And to her credit, Ellen Nakashima, uh, who has this beat for the Washington Post, immediately composed a very, very, very instructive article, title of which was something like, uh, WikiLeaks discloses uh, and, and reveals uh, all of the uh, cyber code the CIA has, okay? Now, she was quick off the mark. She wanted to beat the New York Times, but she didn't really have to hurry because the New York Times, as it always does, this is true. This, as it always does, goes to the administration, CIA normally, and says, gosh, this seems really, really embarrassing. Uh, it's embarrassing enough that they can do this to a car, that they can do this to a TV. My God, this could be really, should we publish? And the, and the administration, no, 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 don't publish that. <laughs> so you won't find a word about mobile framework in the New York Times. What am I saying right. here? Yeah. Yeah. Ray, I wanted to I'm, jump in. Yeah. Um, this is all true, but hit the hatred of Julian you mentioned goes way back to 2010, which, as I pointed out, is the reason why they go on to get him. So they're not. This has nothing to do with the election, the 2016 election. The effort to not to say that didn't increase their hatred for him, especially yeah. in the CIA, as you well know, mm -hmm. because of Vault Seven. Uh, Joe, Joe, I think there's a question of emphasis here. Um, sure, they hate him from another picture, as we used to say about Gene Autry pictures. They hate him from, like, the Indians. They hate him from another picture. But uh, you know, they, weren't, they weren't so avid, so resolute in trying to get him like they're trying to get now. Before he did the uh, DNC emails and, worst of all, this Vault 7. Now, there's an interesting story about Vault 7 marble framework. Just to continue here, you know, that leaves breadcrumbs. And, and so, you know, it's not a leap of imagination if you're an all source analyst to say, well, gosh, uh, that happened to the DNC and breadcrumbs were left in Cyrillic, Russian. Uh, I wonder, wow, it's blamed on this entity called Guccifer 2.0, who nobody knows about. Uh, and uh, well, could that have been, oh, could that have been John Brennan and the CIA? Well, we know that Brennan set up a whole directorate for cyber warfare, 
When I was working there, there were only three directorates. Now there are four, one for cyber warfare. So it's not an unreasonable uh, conclusion to say, well, you know, this Lucifer 2.0 might be <laughs> John Brennan. Anyhow, um, what I want to add as a codicil to this is that, uh, uh, as I understand it from the Hill reporting, John Solomon is the investigative journalist. Uh, he has reported that uh, in March, when they realized that Julian Assange had this kind of information and before he published it, uh, Julian said, well, for a limited uh, safe passage, I'd be willing to make a deal. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you who it wasn't. I'll tell you for sure with evidence, hard electronic evidence, who didn't hack in to the DNC. Whoa, what an offer. Except, guess what? <laughs> US government didn't want to know who didn't hack into the DNC. And so someone until, told Mark Warner, the senator from, uh, from Virginia, who is so hot to get Julian, and he said, call off those negotiations. We don't, we don't, we don't want to deal with Julian, so especially if he's going to tell us with forensic evidence who didn't hack into the DNC. The, re the result was an end to the negotiations. And a couple of days later, as I reconstructed, and I think I'm right, uh, Vault 7 Marble Framework came out as Julian's continuation of publishing these things. Now, if Ju what Julian said in the beginning with respect to having more information from, from this leak from the CIA, then Ed Snowden brought out into Hong Kong. Well, I don't know this for many other reason than Jones logic, then uh, he still has lots of stuff that could be released <clears throat> as soon as he is seized. So, uh, you know, it's a little dicey for the United States government to be, in, to, asking it, to be asking its vassal states, uh, Ecuador, uh, the UK, uh, to perform yet another illegal, internationally reputable, irreputable, uh, unreputable, just <laughs> internationally criminal act to seize Julian Assange when he's got uh, asylum in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy in London. And, you know, Ecuador, well, it's a, you know, it's one of those uh, countries that uh, bargains with the U.S. for lots of aid and IMF loans and stuff. But the UK, you know, my notion is that uh, the UK is so subservient to the United States that they will do things like let their MI6 employees construct spurious dossiers, uh, which have been playing big and, and a dirty role in our politics. I refer, of course, to the steel dossier. It can get this Skripal incident. I hope you'll get Craig Murray on later. Uh, Skripal, it's all, all just invented by the UK. The UK will do just about anything that the US asks them to do. And there should be a certain shame in that, particularly when the, the UK has disgraced itself with this Brexit thing. So my point here is that if there's any, if there's any integrity left in Western Europe, okay, uh, and the Germans and the French look at the UK and say, you know, this is kind of a satrap. It, it's kind of a, a vassal state of Washington. Why should we bother with these people? Let, let them float out into the Atlantic. Uh, well, I would understand that. I mean, it's time for the UK to recognize that it is, is a sovereign state or it isn't. And if it's just one, it's just the 51st state or maybe the 52nd after Israel, then, you know, uh, it, the people should call it, call the UK on that. And if they, if they go ahead and arrest Julian Assange and uh, give him over, that's pretty bad. The last thing I'll say is this, you know, promising not to kill somebody. I mean, in the 21st century, promising not to kill somebody. You know, the only other time I know of this happening was when our Attorney General, Eric Holder, under Obama, uh, wrote a letter to the, his counterpart in Russia, 
and said, now, if you give us uh, Ed Snowden, we promise not to kill him. Oh, well, you know, it's more felicitously uh, phrased, we promise not to subject him to capital punishment. Oh, and we won't torture him either. This is the attorney general of the, so <clears throat> when I hear that uh, the Julian Assange, that there are certain undertakings undertaken by vassal states uh, subservient to the United States, that they won't, they won't kill him. No, no, they just put him in a max security thing for the rest of his life. That means nothing to me. That is a disgrace. And they should be called on that. I think there are enough people with integrity in this world to say, hey, you Brits, why don't you start acting like grownups and, uh, you know, adhere to the rich, the rich tradition you have starting at 1215 with the Magna Carta. Uh, all those things have been eroded simply because you salute so smartly when the U.S. says jump. Uh, I'll right. stop there. Because yeah, Ray, right. you know, the uh, sovereignty issue of this, the United Kingdom, their establishment has very similar, if not identical interests as the American establishment. So uh, they're the ones running the country. You'd mentioned the people. <laughs> I don't know what role they have other than that they should stand up right now and scream about what's happening in front of that embassy. Because frankly, uh, the establishment will turn them over. And if they um, for, if they leave the EU, incidentally, they may not even have to worry about the death penalty because that's really an EU uh, ruling about that, as far as I understand, that uh, there is no death penalty in Britain, but who knows, that could come back with Brexit too. So it's an issue of establishments and their interests, and they're the ones who want to get Assange because he threatens their particular personal interests, their power, their expansion of power, their retention of power. And uh, that goes for the British establishment as well as the American one. So we can't really appeal to uh, Britain doing the right thing here and being independent of the U.S. when when their dependency is, uh, is, is voluntary because they stand to gain as well, the establishment. I'm saying, and the same could go for Australia too, uh, although less so. They have even less reason in this case, in my opinion. And maybe Elizabeth can weigh in on that, being an Australian, than the, than the UK does to not show their sovereignty. Absolutely. No, and, and I also have a question that I want to ask Ray really fast, and that is that, um, you know, in response to the latest news about Assange and the possibility of him being expelled from the embassy, I've seen a lot of Trump supporters say, oh, great, well, you know, we'll, Trump will bring him over and save him. And I think that, you know, speaking from your experience, can you comment on the on that that question and, and maybe or that statement by Trump supporters and the realism or the lack of, of uh, the fact that that's not realistic, especially in light of Trump's nomination and appointment of somebody like Gina Haspel to the director of the CIA? So, you know, can you, you know, you know, educate some of our viewers about the reality that, that Assange might face in the hands of the, something like the CIA and the establishment when, if he uh, gets extradited to the U.S. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this is a really important point, and it's really hard to, uh, for people to understand, but the President of the United States is not President of the United States. That's, you know, that happens to be the truth. Now, it took me a long time to realize that, but the people who, who are in control now, what we call now the deep state, are the people that hang around forever and the people that brief uh, incoming presidents and say, no, we have this dossier or we have this information and, you know, we have certain equities here and, you know, we want to make war in Syria. So don't even think about that. So maybe there are lots of examples and I could use Syria and lots of other things, but maybe the most telling uh, happened about a year ago. Uh, when uh, in the morning, uh, President Trump announced, all right, uh, legislation requires me to release and publish all the remaining documents having to do with the assassination of John Kennedy. Whoa, well, okay. He was required to do that under the, under the legislation. Yeah, I now remember three, that. Three o'clock in the afternoon, he said, oh, changed my mind. I was talking to the FBI and the CIA and they said, we can't do that right now. Uh, even though they had like 20 years to, to do it, right? Uh, we can't do that right now. Uh, we'll revisit that in, in six months. Now, I put a little note in my calendar, you know, six months. <laughs> my government has no megaphone. I kept waiting for some, some 
wire service or some newspaper to say, oh, hey, President Trump, you said that you would declassify the rest of the documents on JFK's assassination in six months. That was six months ago. Uh, where, are, where are they? So, you know, that's pretty crass. And as I say on Syria, he's going to pull out all the troops. So, oh, no, wait a second. The military says, no, we're going to pull out troops. You know. So he's not his own man, okay? So even if he wanted to, even if he wanted to give Julian Assange a free pass or do the decent thing, there's no guarantee at all that he would be able to do that given the Gina Haspels of this world and, and the others who are intimidated and, and just kind of who are incredibly embarrassed at what uh, Julian Assange has done. Now, again, what he's done is publish documentary, unfettered information. And the last thing I'll say on that is that this awful so-called intelligence community assessment, which had no basis, had no, no evidence, was published on the, the 6th of January, 2017. It gave a backhanded compliment to, to Julian Assange. How so? <laughs> well, you know, it, it constructed this, uh, this legend where uh, the Russians hacked into the DNC, no evidence for that, none of juice, and they gave it to Julian Assange. So the question was, why would they give it to Julian Assange? <laughs> and the memo itself says, because of his reputation not to doctor any information that he puts out, they gave it to him because everyone knows that he's reliable. <laughs> so this is the guy that they, they want to do in. You know, I wish it were funny. It's not funny at all. Thank yeah, it's prosecution for, for not publishing fake news like the rest of the media. And that's what it seems to come down to. Joe, indeed, I, yeah. indeed, indeed. That's right. If you don't, if you do your job, you're going to get, you're going to pay for it. And for example, whistleblowers, as you pointed out, doing their job of blowing whistles wind up in jail. And the people who've been blown, who's <laughs> been blown upon, uh, walk free. But that, uh, that tells you a lot about the world we live in and the country we live in here in the U.S. Everything is upside down. Absolutely. I believe Caitlin Johnstone, I hope she'll be on at some point over the weekend, um, had a great quote that said something like, you know, if we lived in even the semblance of a sane world, uh, Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning would be walking free in the sun right now. And I thought that was, yeah, an amazing way to sum it up. Right. And here we are instead sitting, waiting to see if something's going to happen right now in front of the embassy in London, because Marino is caught up in a corruption scandal. Again, uh, he's the guy who needs to go down. And um, he's trying to fight that by further blaming WikiLeaks uh, and using it as an excuse to distract and make him the focus of attention. Um, yes, Ray. Yeah, Joe, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the more hopeful note that you struck earlier on when you said that this Joe Bonatacci, yeah. the yeah. UN rights guy, is going to visit uh, Julian on April 25th. Is that seems to be a very hopeful sign. Yeah, he's the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to privacy. Uh, I believe this came, correct me if I'm wrong, if you know, Elizabeth, I think this was in some reaction to the Cassandra Fanback story of last week, in which um, she gave us an extraordinary insight to the hell that they're making life for, uh, for Julian there in the embassy, where she went to vi visit with him. And in order for, for Julian to enter the conference room, he had to go through a full body scan, which he refused to do. An argument ensued. She was locked inside that room for an hour. And when she finally got out, the ambassador went in, the Ecuadorian ambassador, and there was a shouting match that she was able to hear through the door because the white noise machine had been removed so that they could spy on, on Julian. And indeed, she wound up writing an extraordinary piece uh, about what uh, he had to go through there. Uh, and he uh, had the courage to tell the ambassador to his face that he was a stooge and a, sorry, an agent of the United States, to which he told Julian to shut up. And Julian responded, uh, you're already trying to shut me up, the president. Moreno is shutting me up. I'm not allowed to do my work as a journalist. So here comes this UN expert on privacy uh, announcing just today, and I have no idea. I got it in my, my mailbox because I'm subscribed to this United Nations Human Rights 
special procedures. Um, they are the ones who run the special rapporteurs on torture and other issues, uh, uh, extrajudiciary, extrajudiciary ex executions and whatnot. This is the one on right to privacy. Uh, so they, they put that out today. I don't know whether that's related to what we're talking about, the threat to any hour or any day over the next couple of days to expel him. But this guy, uh, Kanatachi is going to see him on the 25th of April, which raised my hopes because when I saw that date, there seems to be an assumption on this guy's part that he'll still be there um, and that he won't be expelled. And that may, may have been, and again, I don't know what the timing of this, but it's a very short press release. It's only two or three paragraphs. Uh, and that's, not, that's kind of unusual too. So it seems like this could have been a statement from this rapporteur to say, hold on a minute, Ecuador, I'm coming to see him to look into allegations that his privacy is not being respected. And of course, being subject to a full body scan to go from one room to another inside his home, basically, is uh, clearly well, a threat to his privacy. And not only himself, but also his lawyer was supposed, supposed, uh, reportedly subjected to the same type of invasive searching and body scanning simply to go into the room that Cassandra was waiting in and tell her what was going on. It, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. And from what I'm looking at at the WikiLeaks timeline and, and the latest news from them, it sounds like there may, and cor please correct me, Ray and Joe, if I'm wrong here, but I believe it sounds like there may be two different uh, you know, individuals from the UN because it sounds like one special rapporteur is on privacy has announced that visit that we were just discussing yeah. and then another one the expert on torture had expressed alarm and called for Assange to not be expelled etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think it's great that uh, you know figures of that type of stature from the UN are speaking out on this and it really should um, put the US and UK to shame if they do um, you know actually act on these these alleged plans to expel what's, Assange. What's interesting is this short statement from the repertoire on privacy says that uh, he will be visiting on 25 April, quote, after receiving assurances from the government of Ecuador that will, it will facilitate his visit, kind of touch his visit to the country's embassy in London. So uh, they already agreed to this 25 April date, but we don't know when they agreed to that. Clearly, it seems like it was before uh, this issue over the INA papers and this these uh, sources who told WikiLeaks that there's an imminent expulsion. So if in fact um, they said that he could come on the 25th of April, we could assume that there was no plan to expel him uh, before April 25th. But that again came perhaps a few days before this INA papers statement from Moreno blaming uh, WikiLeaks for dumping that. This uh, release goes on to say that the UN expert said the meeting would help determine if there exists a prima facie case of violation of privacy that warrants further investigation. Kanatachi also confirmed that he's requesting further information from the government of Ecuador on a complaint lodged by the president of Ecuador that his privacy had been violated by publication of personal data illegally obtained by a website involved in a so-called INA paper scandal. So, um, in fact, this statement came after the complaint by the president Moreno of Ecuador to the UN. He made his own statement that his privacy had been violated. Everybody's privacy is being violated here. So the, this, uh, this rapporteur will go to also investigate apparently when uh, whether the WikiLeaks had anything to do with with violating Moreno's privacy by publishing the INA papers, which we now we know for sure the INA papers were not published by WikiLeaks. So uh, that's quite interesting. He's going to go and investigate both sides of this to see whether their claims of privacy violations are, are real or not. Very strange. No, absolutely. And and Ray, I don't know how much longer you have that you want to uh, that you have to spend with us. But if, are there any other uh, general thoughts that you would like to share at the moment? Um, you know, as we face this uh, possible terrible event unfolding. Well, I guess um, I have uh, kind of a couple of thoughts having to do with the warning. Um, I don't know uh, how this warning came to WikiLeaks attention, but I have a great deal of respect for the people there. And uh, I can only assume that they thought it was a, a helpful warning from somebody that they trusted. Uh, still, that person probably was just relaying 
uh, something that he or she had heard. So I'm wondering if, uh, if the fly in the ointment here is Moreno, who is feeling under such pressure that he wants to do something really quick in the hopes that the U.S. can, can give him a condo in uh, Miami, you know, uh, when he gets thrown out. In other words, sometimes these things come down to very personal, very, you know, very mundane things. So I think that even if that is the case, it's really, really good that we show our numbers, that we show our concern, and uh, that people be, as John Bolger has appealed for, people be in and around Harrods and, and where, uh, where Julian is, just to show that we do care and that we're not, we're not gonna take this uh, uh, lightly if it happens. Uh, so I think this is really good. I would like to see it continue, uh, but only as long as it has to. I certainly hope that Julian will be sprung. And uh, they, I guess the other, only other thing I'll say is the Australians, you know, I talked uh, pejoratively about the UK and the British, how how lapdogish they are when the U.S. says jump and they jump and say how, how far we can jump. Uh, the Australians, you know, these are an Australian citizen brought up and raised in Australia. They should be proud of them. And instead, the government, again, Joe was right about the establishment, but there are people, you know, there are people that we can appeal to. I mean, uh, Christine is right there. Surely she could uh, at least appeal for, if not get, widespread uh, sympathy and widespread support for for springing Julian. Where would he go? Well, uh, wherever he, he would be safe. Uh, so it seems to be pretty complicated, but boils down to just making sure that this hollow promise that he wouldn't be killed, we won't kill him, but we'll just send him to the United States to to join Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in the Max uh, prison, Max security prison. I mean, people need to see through that. And I do have a certain faith in the people of the UK and the people of Australia, maybe even the people of Ecuador, uh, to think that uh, the agitation and just the knowledge of what's going on, which is what we're promoting here tonight, uh, could help uh, to help prevent the worst and eventually facilitate the best. These things can change. I mean, we haven't talked about the labor leader, Jeremy Corbyn, have we? Well, you know, Jeremy has his head screwed on right, in my view. And if he gets a share in the government or even if he, he gets elected, well, that can change. So we have to keep hope alive and it's not an unrealistic hope. Uh, we just have to hang in there, and I'm just delighted that you guys are, and I'm happy to join you. Well, thank you, Ray. Very, very good of you to, to join us again. Um, and you can stick around, of course, as long as you'd like. Uh, there's just been a video posted on Twitter of Mr. Vaughn, um, Vaughn Smith the, of the Frontline Club in London, and he apparently has just gone to visit Assange a short while ago. I can't confirm that, but there is a video. I'm going to show it now. If I technically do this correctly, I'm going to share the screen and let's see if we could watch this video of here. This is the one. So let's see what he has to say after coming to see Julian just now. More people should be asking, um, but also, um, uh, uh, you know, the no internet is, is a great uh, for, yeah, no internet. for somebody um, who can do things on the internet that you and I can't do can really be done is... You know, it, 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 it's a it's a significant freedom. There's no air, the face. You you you, you fall asleep when you go in there. There's just no oxygen. No air. It's all um, so no, it's a it's a deep down place. There are cameras everywhere. There are two cameras in the meeting room. Two cameras in the meeting room. There's a camera in the little kitchen area. He has. Um, there's not a camera in the lavatory. Great. Right. Yeah. Well, you also have his cat. I haven't seen the cat. I've never seen the cat. Right. Right. Don't know where the cat goes. Sent you to wait. Cheers. Well, that was just a few seconds there of uh, of Vaughn Smith, and he is just telling us, of course, that um, he's telling us that I believe uh, you should be able to stop sharing. So either at the top uh, or the bottom. 
I don't see it now, unfortunately, but uh, um, he's telling us that there are cameras everywhere, including um, in the kitchen. I hadn't heard that before. I hadn't heard that before. Uh, Elizabeth, have you? Uh, no, I had not heard about cameras in the kitchen, but I know that I, I had heard uh, Cassandra say, you know, m multiple times that there were cameras everywhere uh, when she visited, but she emphasized um, the bugging and, and large obvious cameras in the conference room that she was placed in um, on her last attempted meeting uh, with Assange very recently. But um, I know that she had mentioned a lot of, of surveillance before, and I believe there was, was it, I th and correct me, was it Craig Murray who visited and then wrote about the fact that he had had to uh, resort to passing notes to Assange to to well, just... that was Cassandra. Cassandra did yeah, that she... in January, right? January, right. January's visit. I don't know about Definitely. Craig Murray. That might have been the case as well. I, I could explain the kitchen. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> that's where, at least in my kitchen, that's where the leaks come in. That's oh, uh, that's leaks... what it is. That's yeah. what it is. Makes sense. That they now, want to know what, what plot he's see cooking up, you know. So, right, uh, cooking up. What about if the plumber comes? Does he use a hack saw to, uh, <laughs> to work on the pipes to fix the leak? It is a hack to fix the leak, apparently, right? You see? That's another <laughs> indication that we're dealing with leaks here, not hacks. I'll tell you who the hacks are the ones at The Guardian, at The New York <laughs> Times, at various yeah, other media. And the chief, the hacker, and the hack in chief, of course, is Luke Harding who I would think would be in hiding right now, incidentally, Ray. We haven't talked to you since Mueller's uh, conclusion. There was a conclusion on collusion, that there was none. So where is Mr. Luke Harding, whose best-selling New York Times book was titled Collusion? Well, there are no consequences, no consequences. Uh, you have uh, Isikoff and David Korn writing about Russian roulette based mainly on the dossier from Steele. And Corn is still, <laughs> God, you know, it will be very interesting to see uh, how they can twist this once the full report comes out. Because as uh, Glenn Greenwald said right off the bat, the notion that Mueller would sit back and let Barr distort the main conclusions of his report is uh, pretty much a stretch, right? Now, I would add this. Um, there's a difference between saying no collusion and actually no interference with the investigation and separate, did the Russians do it? Now, they're still saying that the Russians did it and the Russians gave it to WikiLeaks. Now, why are they saying that? Because Bob Mueller said that in indictments and all kinds of, on whom did he base that? Guccifer 2.0. Who's Guccifer 2.0? We don't know, but we can prove he's a fraud. And you and I <laughs> said, Bill Binney, as he spread out that spreadsheet, showing how forensically you can show Guccifer 2.0 is a fraud. That doesn't matter. Mueller's report will still have Russian hacking, right? and Russians hacking, giving it to WikiLeaks. So uh, Trump is off the hook, in my view, unless something really bizarre happens. But this whole notion about Russia trying to interfere with our election, the primary evidence being from a DNC employed and paid dubious cyber warfare uh, uh, outfit, um, you know, it's really, what, uh, what people need to know is that when James Comey was asked, softball question uh, by the head of the Senate, in, uh, in Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, he said, now, Mr. Comey, um, you didn't have access to the Democratic National Committee computers, did you? Uh, and Comey said, no, we didn't get access. <laughs> I'm going, it's the head of the FBI, right? He has access to all my friends in NSA by reading their, their homes in the morning, uh, you know, gets access to everything that takes them away. And he can't, he can't request access to the DNC computers or he can't go to a judge and say, give me a warrant. I want to seize those computers. Give me a break. Anyhow, the chairman of the committee says, now, 
why was that, Mr. Comey? And Comey says, well, um, it is best practice. Uh, I can see it. it's best practice uh, to get physical access to these computers, but uh, we relied on a first rate, a private enterprise. And uh, my, my, uh, my, my people, I mean, my former people told me that that was enough, chairman. But for a counterintelligence investigation, you need to have content, right? Call me. Well, yes, but my people, I mean, my former people tell me that they had a lot, a lot of talk with this super right, uh, super uh, forensic place and uh, that their forensics were enough. Now, that was the first signal that something was really strange there. Now, let me, that, that's, that's fact. That's what James Comey said. I've got it memorized. Now, let me speculate. This is not fact. Uh, CrowdStrike had been hired weeks before the leaks. Weeks, okay? Weeks before the incursions. Uh, what was Comey protecting? Well, if he sent his forensic investigators from the FBI into those computers, it seems to me quite possible that they may have said, come back to James Comey and said, Mr. Comey, you won't believe what we found in those computers. There are, oh, there are 700 million lines of code there. I, 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 very sophisticated. We can't figure it out. Uh, would you want us to, to check with the NSA? <laughs> and Comey was, no, 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 don't check with the NSA. In other words, the FBI computer specialists would not have been able to figure out what happened, in my view, because it wasn't the Russians and it wasn't anybody else. It was some of our own guys. And the last thing that Comey wanted to uh, let people know was that he and, and Brennan and the, the NSA uh, leader had combined uh, to put this malware uh, using the notional Lucifer 2.0 in there, and they don't want anybody to find that out. So let CrowdStrike do it. CrowdStrike has a terrible reputation. Why James Comey called it a first-rate outfit? Well, I was going to say it's beyond me, but it's not at all beyond me. It all fits together. That's speculative, but I think, you know, that might come out in the wash in the next couple of months. Ray, do you know what uh, when they hired CrowdStrike? Was that April of 2016? It was very early April. No, no, wait a second. It was very early March. March. Wow. They, wow. Yeah, okay. they, they, do you know, they you know yeah, March they hired uh, CrowdStrike. Early April, March. Like, yeah, like and listen, and, yeah, and in April, the next month, they hired Steele to do the, to link Trump to Russia, colluding with Russia. And then the next month, in May is when the NDNC became aware that their computers were compromised. So they had already set up CrowdStrike and Steele to tie Trump to Russia before they even knew that they had been uh, hacked or it had been leaked from them. I and then so. uh, it was a couple of months later, the CrowdStrike then blamed uh, the DNC, uh, yeah. the Russia's for the, and then three months before the DNC emails were, were published. In other mm -hmm. words, they had Steele and CrowdStrike set up before they even knew their computers were compromised. Well, Joe, I think that they knew their computers were compromised earlier than March. No, I right in May. No, earlier than March. Earlier than March, they invited. So I've Crowd, discovered it. They, it was they in invited May. CrowdStrike in at the first first week of March. Now, the, the thing is that if there were compromise, as the DNC thought, the CrowdStrike should have shut them down right away. That's standard practice for computer security. You shut them down. Instead. CrowdStrike let it go to the point where the real intrusions on the 23rd and 25th, 27th, uh, I think it's 27th of, of March, which is uh, March, which I think is when, uh, when we're talking about the, uh, the actual things that came out uh, and were forensically diagnosed, those came before CrowdStrike did anything at all. So. The whole thing is really, really bizarre, and uh, 
we, we have that kind of noted in our, uh, in our findings. Thank you.